we've just seen a simple example of principal component analysis on a two-dimensional data set. And now it's time to try something with a few more dimensions. So we're going to bring back our baby kinematics data uh, that has about uh, 74 dimensions. And, uh, and we're going to play a bit with that. Right, this skeleton is already in the Git repository. It's essentially the same as what we've uh, done uh, so far with the baby kinematics data. So I'm just going to work through that. Uh, here's our pipeline definitions, our loading process. So here we've pulled out both the kinematics and the velocity, the, the, the position components and the velocity components here. Create our pipelines and finally pull out execute our pipelines, so pull the data out of the pipelines. All right, so, so at this point, uh, now we've, we've actually uh, created a, a data set. We're going to use this input pose file, which includes columns for both the positions and the velocities. So I'm going to sort of formalize this a little bit more in terms of a training process. We're going to take 8,000 of the available samples and we'll use that for training our PCA model. And we we'll want to work, look at how well it does on an independent uh, data set. Um, so these are time sorted. Uh, so by uh, taking the first 8,000, uh, hopefully the, the latter couple of thousand of samples will be relatively independent uh, of our original training set. So let's pull out those. So we're pulling out from zero to n training uh, rows and all columns. And for the validation set, we're going to pull out the remaining uh, the remaining rows. Inputs. Okay, so this this is selecting the remaining rows and still all columns. And we'll also need to know what time it is for the plotting purposes. We'll pull out the corresponding elements there. Okay, so I just executed that and we're good to go there. So let's create our PCA model here. I'm just for for the moment. I'm just going to use PCA with the default parameters, which means that uh, it's going to end up generating a model with the number of components being equal to the input uh, feature number that we have. So we're not going to do any compression, but it's going to allow us to ask some additional questions. So there's our training process, and and there we go. One of the properties that we have with this PCA object is uh, something called explained variance ratio. So now that we've trained the model, we can ask about that property. And what it does is it tells us the fraction of uh, variance that each one of our principal components is actually occupying. So amongst these, there's one that is the the, the highest fraction, uh, actually these are sorted. So this particular component is explaining 27.8% of the variance in the data, which is kind of astounding that with all the complexity of the baby movement that one principal component can actually uh, explain that much of the data. Uh, the next one down is 12.6%, and then we start to get to 9%, 5%, et cetera. Let's look at this visually here. So these are the fractions that each individual component explains. If we take a sum of all of these, that would sum up to one. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to say, if, if we kept the first k components, what's the total fraction of variance that we'd be able to represent? And in order to do, to do that, we need to know first, if, if k is equal to one, then we have just this. 
If k is equal to 2, then we have both of those, so we want to know what the sum is of those. If k is equal to 3, we want to know what the sum is of those. And uh, we can use a, uh, a function from the NumPy package that will do this cumulative sum for us. So explained, and it's called cumsum. You see this uh, function in MATLAB as well. And, and that's it. So it's going to give us a vector back, which is exactly that cumulative sum. It'll tell us, it'll give us that number, and then it'll give us the sum of those two, and then the sum of these three, and then the sum of these four, et cetera. And now let's plot that as a function of number of features. Okay, there we go. So that very first component, this this point right right here, that is the the place where we uh, have uh, twenty seven percent, and and you can see that the first few, so the first ten explain something of, of about uh, eighty five percent of the uh, entire variance of the data set. And you get up to 20, and we're, all, we're already explaining uh, something into the 90s. And then it drops off from there. So, that, so, that's, so that's actually pretty cool. And, and everything that, that this baby has done over a five minute period of time with its arms and legs and trunk, uh, we can distill down to a very small number of variables. OK, so let's look at a PCA subspace here. Let's start with just two for fun. So I'm going to build a PCA model that has just the two components. So, so what we're going to do is uh, compress our data down to just the two dimensions, and then we're going to bring it back out to our original, our original uh, full set of dimensions. So that's our compressed representation there. And, and then we'll look at uh, our reconstructed features. OK, and then next, let's go ahead and plot. What I first want to do is uh, plot what the uh, two components are actually doing. OK, so I had a replicated A there. Oh, I want X compressed. OK, there we go. So, so this isn't, we're, we're, we've blown out to the entire 300 seconds of a single trial. And you can see the, uh, there are two components here. One varies with very high frequency, and the other uh, varies very gradually over the entire uh, the entire data set, which is uh, interesting. So let's, let's zoom in on a very specific uh, region here.
So I'm going to set the X limit. Uh, let's look at second six, 50 to 60, and, and there we go. So, so that very first component is, uh, is not varying a whole lot within this time period. What it's probably doing is capturing the very high uh, level picture of what particular activity the baby is engaged in. So the baby might have a different posture if they're trying to reach off to the left or, a, or if they're uh, trying to uh, do some sort of uh, locomotion. The, the second component here in orange is varying a lot and that's, that's capturing more the, the uh, tens of milliseconds scale activity that the infant is engaged in. All right, the next thing I'd like to do is look at what the reconstruction looks like after we've compressed and then brought it back out. We're going to look at a particular uh, channel. I'm just going to pick one here. Actually, let's do some cutting and pasting. So we're, again, we're going to plot over, uh, over some amount of time, except now we're going to look at uh, re the reconstruction. And we called that uh, X reconstruct. And I, I don't want to look at all 70 something channels. Let's look at uh, a very small, but let's just look at the one that we're asking about here. We're going to plot that in red. And for reference, let's also plot the original data. So this is our INS training. And we're going to focus, let's, let's go out a little bit wider than just that 10 second period. Oops. Finally, let me add a legend in here so we can uh, interpret what's going on. Okay, so so I just I just switched uh, the two plot lines here. Uh, in INS training, that's the original, it's being plotted in blue, and that corresponds to the original legend, and then this is our reconstruction in red. Okay, so, so there's the, the picture that we have, and what you can see is that the reconstruction is actually quite poor, and uh, that's, that's to be uh, expected. Uh, we've only, we're only using two of our uh, principal components to try and capture all of the variants across these 70 something channels and uh, we're clearly not really capturing very much of the, the variants for this channel. So let's play a little bit with different numbers of uh, components. So let's go up to five here and, and so we're, we're going to build a new PCA model with five components do the training. Now we have five different components. You can see not only do we have the the orange and the blue in here, but now we have some other components and those are varying quite a bit. So hopefully we can convey a bit more information down to the reconstruction. And there we go. So, so with just five principal components, we're at least getting the, the trend of the original data, which is uh, quite uh, impressive. So let's, let's go ahead and look at what happens when we increase this number of components to 10. You can see now we're plotting each one of the 10 components. There's not a whole lot to, to, to get out of this picture at this point since there are so many different curves. And let's look at the reconstruction. And, and you can see now we're, we've homed in a, a bit more. We've, we've got a bit of this high frequency noise in this reconstruction, but we're starting to get little features like 
like here, red is tracking uh, blue, although there are other places where red is not tracking blue very nicely. Let's double that number again. That our plot of our principal component uh, values is not terribly uh, uh, informative anymore, especially given that the colors are starting to rotate. Um, but here now we're starting to pick up on some of the higher frequency uh, kinds of things. So the features right in this vicinity, we're doing nice reconstruction for. Red is starting to take care of this, this uh, descent with the blue, um, but it's still not quite there. We haven't worked out this feature here yet. But as we continue to increase this number of, of uh, principal components that we're using, remember we have 70 something, and now I'm going to go up to 40. Uh, our ability to reconstruct the original curve is, is getting better and better. So that's with more than half. So we're doing compression, compression down to about half of the original dimensionality. And, and when we bring it back out, we, we can actually do a, a pretty good job of reconstructing that. Taking this next step, let's go up to 60, which is at this point, uh, essentially all of our principal components. And our reconstruction now is, is uh, quite spot on. And if, if we continue to push that up to 70, and I think we have 74, um, what we'll end up doing is resolving these small high frequency differences between the red and the blue curves. Okay, so I encourage you to play a bit more with this. It, what, again, what's really cool here is that with just a handful of, uh, of uh, dimensions, we can actually take this very complicated baby data set uh, and explain a lot of what's going on. But as you can see, we're only able to capture what's happening at a very gross level uh, in order for us to really address the very fine features in a particular channel, uh, we have to increase the number of degrees of freedom quite a bit more. The other thing to keep in mind here is that all of these transformations that we've been doing are linear transformations. All right, so 60 features is actually doing quite well. I, I wanna drop back to make a point here about uh, 20 features. Let's push that back through. Okay, so, so the reconstruction here is not uh, quite uh, so good, but it, we also need to uh, ask the question of how well our PCA model actually performs on independent data. So let's take a look at that. So we've already built the model itself, and let's ask, how well this model is going to perform on the, these other data points that we held out from our data set. So first we're going to transform that uh, validation set into our PCA space, and then we're going to reconstruct. Okay, and finally, let's go ahead and plot that. So here's the plotting code from above. Let me just uh, insert the new predictions here. And now we're going over time validation. And it's ins validation. So the blue is, is the original data here. And our time period is going to be different, so I'm going to comment that out for right now. And there we go. So we've uh, now reconstructed our, it looks like about 240 seconds out to 300 uh, seconds for our trial. And uh, the model's not doing too bad. It's at least getting the, the gross of behavior of the blue curve. Uh, but it is missing some of the finer features. So there are differences here 
there's a, a fairly large difference in this vicinity here, and, and then the predictions are offset uh, off uh, in this area here. Let's, let's go ahead and kick the number of features up now. So 60 for our training set, we were reconstructing really well. So there's our training set reconstruction. Let's do the same here. And, and you can see we're actually matching that quite a bit better. However, we've only compressed our data down from 74 channels down to 60 channels. And that's a little bit uh, dissatisfying there. So that's our quick demonstration of principal component analysis and how we can use it to take a large number of features and compress them down to a smaller number of features and yet preserve a lot of the uh, information in the original data set. Fundamentally, PCA is trying to uh, minimize the prediction error after we do reconstruction. So, so, so in some sense, we're doing uh, something called an autoencoder, where we start with a set of features, we're compressing down to uh, a smaller feature space, and then we're expanding back out to our original feature space. And we're trying to minimize uh, the loss of information as we go uh, into the, through that smaller pipe. This turns out to be a, a very central idea to some of the kinds of things that we do in the deep learning world when we're trying to learn very salient and compressed representations. And, and this is something hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit toward the end of the semester. Next up, we're gonna take one more step in the PCA world uh, by using kernel functions as a means of pre-processing our feature sets before we do the PCA compression.